Good afternoon, esteemed members of Vaccine Choice Canada. Uh, my name is Dr. Jessica Rose, and today I'm going to present some findings from a study that I've recently submitted for peer review, and it has actually been accepted, entitled A Report on the U.S. Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System of the COVID-19 mRNA Biologicals. From here on in, I'll refer to these products as either biologicals, products, or injections. This photo, as my title slide, is actually a real photo of a billboard, which is currently on display where I live. It is one of many, and it's not a joke, nor an advertisement for a new theatrical event. This is what we get to see every day as part of the, the rollout, which has been ongoing since January. And they're starting a new campaign slash rollout to get this product or these products into as many children from ages 12 to 16 as they can, and also pregnant women. A little bit of background. First of all, what is VAERS? VAERS is an acronym for the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and this is uh, specific to the United States. And it was created by the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to receive reports about adverse events that may be associated with vaccines. The primary purpose for maintaining this database is to serve as an early warning or signaling system for adverse events that weren't detected during pre-market testing. What is an adverse event? It's defined as any untoward or unfavorable medical occurrence uh, in a human study participant, and that includes any abnormal physical exam or a lab, lab finding, symptom, disease, anything temporarily associated with the involvement in the research or, uh, or rollout, whether or not it's considered related to the participation. So most vaccine adverse event reports are actually minor, and these include uh, such symptoms as injection site pain, uh, headaches, chills, things like this. But there are uh, reports of serious or severe adverse events, which of course are of the greatest concern, and they are meant to receive the most careful scrutiny by their staff uh, and healthcare professionals. A severe adverse event is defined as any adverse event that results in death or that is life-threatening or that places the participant at immediate risk of death from the event as it occurred may or may not require prolonged hospitalization, uh, cause persistent or significant disability or incapacity, uh, may result in congenital an anomalies or birth defects, or is uh, another condition that investigators would judge to represent signif significant hazards. This system is essential, but it's very imperfect. One of the many imperfections with this system is underreporting. So there have been some studies done that cl make claims as to approximately 1% to 10% of actual events get reported. But there's also the issue of under-recording. If uh, an adverse event gets reported, it doesn't necessarily make it to the database. Um, there are all sorts of imperfections with the system, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't underplay its, its importance and value. And so to date, uh, the global rollout of the Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen products uh, in particular have led to actually, well, it's hundreds of thousands of individuals reporting adverse events using this system. So today I'm going to touch on three major uh, findings from my study. The first one uh, is in reference to the VARES ID counts and the severe adverse account, uh, event count and, uh, and percentage, and also the immunological adverse events that are being reported. 
The second will involve uh, evidence of causation in that the, the injections are actually causing the adverse events. And the third will touch on uh, breakthrough infections, which uh, are cases of COVID that occurred in spite of the injections. So let's start with the, uh, the first point here, the general data uh, regarding the VAERS IDs. So a question for the audience members. You're probably wondering this already, or maybe you already know uh, whether or not the VAERS data in, with reference to the ID counts and the severe adverse event counts or frequencies are, are different somehow, or they look the same as last year or previous years. Um, so let's look at the numbers. Uh, we can determine that very quickly. So this is a plot, a time series plot of all the, the VAERS data from its, uh, from its uh, development and use, which started in 1990. Um, so this is the number of VAERS IDs. Each individual that, uh, that files a report gets an ID number. So each ID number represents one person who suffered an adverse event. Um, so as you can see in this time series plot, the, the numbers are, are uh, growing as the years go by. And of course, this does have to do with population growth, but uh, as you'll see in the following slides, I normalize, normalize this to population growth, and it's not solely due to that. It's due to two other main things. One, the increased number of, uh, of vaccines that are actually being put into the public, and number two, the increased frequency of adverse events as a result of doing so. So if we were going to uh, play around with our numbers here and assume that this 45 degree angle trajectory upwards was going to continue into the future, then we may uh, expect the final count of adverse events uh, at the end of 2021, this year, to be somewhere around 62,000. That's based on this uh, trajectory shooting upwards, which is basically just, it's the, the fit to the data here. So all in all, the vaccine, uh, the vaccine injury reports appear to be on the rise. This plot on the right here is another time series plot. Now this is only for 2021. Um, and this is only adverse events that are associated with COVID-19 products, only. So up until March, it appears as though nothing much is happening in terms of absolute numbers of adverse events. Um, if this trajectory had continued into the future, then the w we wouldn't be talking about this right now. Sometime early March, the numbers started to go up, and I was unsure until recently where this, uh, this increase was going, whether or not it was going to keep trending upwards. But now there's no doubt in my mind that this is an exponential growth curve. Now, there's no way to predict. Uh, this is clearly going to end up being a logistic growth curve, but we don't know where upon the exponential part of the curve we are right now. We could be at the very beginning, or we could be in the middle, or we could be close to the end. We don't know yet. Um, so it's hard to make any predictions based on this data yet. But the absolute number of adverse events is up 36% for, for the latest update. Uh, and by the way, the updates uh, come in every Friday at around 5 p.m. my time. And this is by far the biggest jump I've seen. Every week that I update my data into my code, it's the biggest jump that I've seen so far. So um, this is by absolute number, of course. So we are at uh, 146,622 
uh, adverse event reports right now. And here's one of the moments when I'm going to stress that this is uh, most likely at one or two orders of magnitude less than the actual adverse event number. And uh, as I mentioned before, the plot on the left here is normalized to the US population. Um, so just to, to repeat, it's, it's not only due to population growth that we're seeing this increase. So what about severe adverse events? Because, I mean, sure, the absolute number of adverse events is increasing, but if they're all mild, uh, if this is just chills and headaches, then it's, it's not really a uh, reason to be alarmed. However, <laughs> the VAERS handbook states that approximately 15% of reported AEs are typically severe adverse events. Uh, and we're at 19% now, as of Friday, last Friday. Um, and it peaked at 57%, which is really, really high. Uh, so we've been consistently above the, uh, the standard the entire time. And we remain above the standard. So the VAERS data at the moment does not look the same as last year at all. It doesn't look the same as any year. Um, and most, uh, a lot of people have been asking, well, naturally that's because we have uh, more vaccines being given. And, and yes, that's true. However, uh, this is more about the, the proportion of adverse events as per the, the fully vaccinated population being much higher. So what else is standing out? So I grouped the adverse event data according to, uh, to whether or not the individual died, uh, required hospitalization, required an emergency doctor visit, um, or whether the adverse event was related to a cardiovascular problem, a neurological problem, or an immunological problem. I really, I really needed to see uh, what was going on in these particular divisions because I had a hunch that I was going to see something special in the immunological group. So again, on the left here, uh, I have a time series plot of the absolute number of VAERS IDs for each of these groups. And everything seems copacetic until uh, early March. And then everything... Uh, all the trajectories start to increase, some more slowly than others, such as uh, death. It is increasing slowly, but it is increasing the count. It's approximately 350 to 500 people per week. Uh, and what stands out here is the immunological adverse event trajectory. I mean, it really is a standalone adverse event group here. and. We can hypothesize at the moment as to what we're seeing here and why we're seeing this for now, um, but I'll save that until the next slide. And this is the uh, probably a little bit more meaningful way to show this is the the percentage of the the uh, adverse event groups as per the fully vaccinated population in the United States. So again. Until May, or sorry, March, we didn't see much uh, in the way of activity or growth. But then following early March, we're seeing this upward trajectory of the uh, immunological adverse events. Again, we can hypothesize as to what's going on here. And one, one hypothesis is that this is the work of pathogenic priming. A beautiful article was uh, published by James Lyons Weiler very recently about this subject. And for those of you who don't know, pathogenic priming happens uh, due to homology between human and viral proteins, and it can lead to autoimmunity, uh, either via the virus or the vaccine. And for those of you who don't know, homology is just a similarity 
between two, two things due to shared an ancestry between a pair of uh, structures or genes in different taxa. So what he found in this, uh, in this uh, work that he did was that one third of the immunogenic proteins in SARS-CoV-2 have potentially problematic homology to proteins that are key not only to human uh, components, but to the human adaptive immune system. And this is, this is potentially really devastating. If this is what we're seeing here, um, we can only speculate right now. Um, but this concept, this hypothesis, might actually explain why we're seeing this rapid rise in immunological adverse events. This really needs to be looked at. So just to summarize this first part, the, the VAERS ID count alone is already higher. It's twice as high as all of the adverse event data for last year combined. And this is not typical. The severe adverse events are uh, up 26.6%, which is also atypical according to the VAERS handbook. And the immunological adverse events are standing out growth-wise, and this could be due to pathogenic priming. So the next section of the presentation is going to be on the subject of causation. It's a huge question um, in the world of uh, biologicals, medicinals, and therapeutics. Um, cause and effect relationships uh, in biology and epidemiology are, are notoriously hard to, to prove. Um, so that's going to be the subject of the next section. So the question is, are, are these biologicals or injections causing the adverse events that we're seeing? So the way that you can approach this problem uh, epidemiologically is to provide evidence of causality using what's called the Bradford Hill criteria. So in 1965, a statistician named uh, Austin Bradford Hill proposed a set of nine criteria to provide epidemiologic evidence of a causal relationship between a presumed cause and an observed effect. Um, I won't go through the nine points. Uh, safe to say that uh, most of them, if not all of them, should be satisfied in order to satisfy the criteria and uh, provide evidence of causation. Now, this has to be backed up by uh, statistical evidence as well, which I will get into. And the three main points uh, that I will focus on in this presentation are going to be association or correlation, which is necessary, and specificity, which is another point, uh, with respect to the adverse event groupings themselves. Time ordering, which is extremely important in a cause-effect relationship, something came before something else. And also non-spuriousness, which is difficult to prove. Um, this, is when, this is how you show that other factors were not actually the factors that uh, were the cause, causative uh, factors. So I'd like everyone to do a thought experiment here and assume that the injections have absolutely nothing to do with the adverse events because this is something that uh, a large majority of people love to cling to, especially in the, uh, in the world of vaccinations. Uh, there are many, many, many people who, who almost aggressively defend the position that there's absolutely no way that these... Uh, these injections could possibly be doing any harm. So I'd like everyone to join that population mentally for a moment. Um, we're gonna play devil's advocate here. So what would that look like in terms of a trajectory on an XY axis? The vaccine adverse event reporting system data comes with uh, a vaccination date, the date that the person got the injections, uh, the onset of the adverse event date is recorded. And so you can calculate the amount of time that passed between these two, uh, these two points. And I, I calculated this in days. 
So that's what you see on the axis, uh, the x-axis here. This is the difference between the vaccine date and the onset of uh, symptoms date. So zero means uh, anything within uh, no time to 24 hours, for example, and so on. So if we assume that the injections have nothing to do with the adverse events and that say, say someone died, um, then we could safely say that that person might have died even before they got their injection and or any day after. The likelihood that they're going to die at any given point surrounding that moment when they got vaccinated is equal under this assumption. So what we would expect to see is that the percentage of reported adverse events would be the same for any given time period before or after the injection. So in terms of uh, this trajectory, we would see a straight line distributed evenly uh, about the y-axis, which is the percentage of reported adverse events. So the trajectory along the x-axis would have an even distribution about that y-axis, as I just said. But this is not what we see when we look at the actual data, which is what we call the observed values. What we actually see is something like this. So this is the actual observed values from the death adverse event group in comparison with the expected values that we calculated from the actual data. If there were no causation, if there were no relationship between the, the time when the injections were given and the onset of events, then we wouldn't see a clustering of these data around day zero or one. But we do see a clustering around day zero or one. A large percentage of the adverse events were reported within 24 hours, in fact. And this is statistically significant by the chi-square test, where we throw out the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that there is an equal um, chance that somebody will succumb to an adverse event at any given time point along this x-axis. This was found for hospitalizations and also for uh, recorded ER visits. The same phenomenon, we see a clustering. The highest percentage of adverse events were reported within 24 hours for both of these groups. And the same thing for the cardiovascular, the neurological, and the immunological adverse events. The same clustering around day zero was observed. Just as a point of interest, uh, in case anyone noticed, there's this bump going on in the immunological adverse events um, trajectory around day seven. And I think this is most likely just a, an, a normal immune response to the new antigenic proteins that are being produced by the bodies of the people who got the, uh, the templates injected into their cells. So there's nothing, there's nothing special to report here. I just, uh, I mean, th there might be something more to it, but I won't linger on this for now. I just wanted to raise it in case anybody noticed it and was wondering. Now, I also did uh, some analysis on two standalone groups uh, of adverse events. One was anaphylaxis and one was uh, spontaneous abortions, which I will get to. The reason I chose anaphylactic reactions was sort of as a positive control for this way of, uh, of checking for causation. Anaphylactic events or shock uh, are generally known as being acute reactions. They happen very quickly after a trigger. Uh, sometimes within seconds, sometimes within minutes, but very, very shortly thereafter a trigger. So what we would expect if these injections were actually causing the anaphylaxis would be to, that we would see a clustering 
of the reports very, very close to zero, most of them. And that's what we see, in fact. We see about 83% of all of the reports clustered around zero. So it serves as a positive control. The spontaneous abortion list is growing, and this isn't actually uh, considered a death in the adverse event reporting system, but I consider it to be one, and if, not, if nothing else, it's very severe and traumatizing. Um, in addition to this, uh, there are many, many reports of female reproductive adverse events. Many, many women are, are not only reporting, but they're writing stories uh, on social media uh, outlets, for example, about having problems with dysmenorrhea, uh, for example, breakthrough bleeding. I, I've read uh, women who've gone, already been, gone into menopause are starting uh, to bleed again. So there's a lot of dysfunction going on with regards to the female reproductive system, and this is very, very, very serious. Women, of course, represent about half of our population, and they're very important, and uh, this, this absolutely needs to be addressed, uh, in my opinion, before any further rollouts continue. This is very serious. Um, and in fact, this is what the VARES is for. This is, this is something that wasn't detected in the phase three clinical trial, and it's being detected now, and the numbers are growing by the week. And so it needs, something needs to be done. A response has to be taken. And just to summarize, uh, there's very clear association correlation, which, by the way, I also show with heat maps, but I, I didn't show here, uh, and specificity with regards to the, the grouping of the adverse events themselves. Of course, there's time ordering. One definitely always preceded the, the other. And I didn't show this again here, but uh, in ter in, with regards to non-spuriousness, I checked uh, in, in the, the adverse event reporting system data, they also include uh, other medications that the people might have been on, uh, allergies, and pre-existing uh, medical conditions. So I checked uh, all of these things as, as potential factors that may have been the cause, for example, and there was no, no statistical significance in any of the, the groups that I checked. So safe to say I, that point has been satisfied. So to answer our question, are the injections causing the AEs? And I would say that it's very likely based on this evidence. And I'd also like to drive home in case there are some actual skeptics in the audience, which I would love. Um, please explain to me, if you don't believe this evidence, uh, why we're seeing this clustering of adverse events around day zero. It's maybe I didn't think of something. I'd love to hear, uh, to hear anybody's thoughts on that. So the last point uh, I'm going to discuss in this short presentation are breakthrough infections, which are also on the rise. As I mentioned before, breakthrough infections are people coming down with COVID-19 symptoms even after getting the vaccine. So exactly what you uh, got the vaccine for, well, most people would think that they would get it so that they wouldn't get COVID, actually did succumb. And what I found is that it's actually more linked to the Pfizer products. So to date, we are at 2,776 breakthrough uh, infections, which represents about 1.9% of all of the adverse event reports. And to me, this is not a small number. And every week, it's growing. This is a pie chart that shows the uh, contribution of each injection manufacturer uh, with regards to the three most prominent in the United States, which is Pfizer and BioNTech, Moderna and Janssen. And it's very clear to see that um, the contribution of Pfizer is much, 
much higher than the other two. And we can't really say anything about that until we know about the distribution of the products overall in the US population because this, the one on the left is a sample of the vaccinated people, but we really need to look at the, the total population. So the pie chart on the right shows the distribution of products into the U.S. population as a whole, and you can see that it's about 50-50. There's nothing, uh, nothing surprising here in terms of distribution of products. So what that means is that Pfizer actually is apparently more associated with breakthrough COVID cases, which is very interesting. And again, this needs to be examined. So Pfizer comprises a large percentage of the report. And since uh, they, they only comprise about half of the, uh, the fully vaccinated population, then we can safely uh, say that Pfizer is more highly associated with the, the breakthrough cases. So what about deaths? Because this whole thing, this whole SARS COVID thing is evidently about uh, people being afraid of dying. So how many people died from these breakthrough COVID cases after getting these injections? So let me just contextualize first. We're talking about people who were uh, COVID-19 negative, and I'm assuming that they check these things before they give the injections, although I shouldn't assume that. But I am assuming they were so-called healthy. They got the injection, then they got the COVID-19 symptoms, got diagnosed with COVID-19, and then they died. This is the, the most terrible irony I, I can imagine. And this is, represents about 6% of all the people who succumb to breakthrough infections, which is, again, I don't think that's a small number when you consider what we're talking about here. So this is the distribution of the uh, manufacturers in terms of the breakthrough infections and death. So again, it, it's, it's about 50-50. So that there isn't really a, a manufacturer that's more highly associated with death in terms of breakthrough infections, which I guess is good news. But are these related to age? I mean, one might expect that, uh, that more, more elderly people are going to succumb to death from COVID since that seems to be the trend so yes, um, there are more uh, deaths associated with the elderly. Um, the most, for the most part, uh, people between the ages of 80 to 90 years, uh, they make up the biggest pie, uh, piece of the pie here, and the second biggest piece is, are the 70 to 80 year olds. So yes, it is related to, to age, but this isn't surprising. Um, I would actually expect that to be the case. So to summarize this last point, um, COVID-19 and COVID-19 death adverse events uh, occur following injection, which is uh, ironic. It's more frequently associated with the Pfizer product, which is definitely something that warrants further investigation. And the last point is that uh, death following uh, COVID-19 breakthrough infection followed by the injections are age-related. So to summarize uh, today's talking points, uh, three points of convention or accepted views have been challenged in my opinion just on these three points. The first of which is that the severe adverse events are more frequent with the COVID-19 injectables. This is, again, it has been typically higher than the reported standard percentage, which is 15% uh, the entire time since the, the rollout started last December and it remains uh, well above this 15% uh, this 
mark. The causation evidence that I've provided contradicts the notion that the injections are not causing the adverse events. And again, I challenge and, and would, would welcome any evidence or anybody to give me scientific reasons uh, supported by evidence and statistics why we would be seeing this clustering of adverse events around day zero and day one. And the breakthrough infections, while they are infrequent for now, uh, but are on the rise, they do call into the question the efficacy of these biologicals. They also call into question whether or not what we're seeing is due to pathogenic priming. So to conclude, um, I'd like to point out that any risk-benefit analysis has to include a discussion of therapeutics when you're dealing with uh, biologicals. Now, since we have repurposed drugs like chloroquine and zinc combinations and ivermectin, for example, all showing positive results in patients uh, with all all kinds of uh, symptoms in, in various disease states, it's very unclear to me why these drugs aren't being more extensively promoted as effective tools in the fight against this virus, which begs the question, why, why the fast-tracking of brand-new biological products, which is costing billions of dollars, when we have these drugs in our hands right now, FDA approved safe track records for decades in the case of ivermectin and chloroquine, why? Why this enormous uh, and excessive time and energy and money to, to produce brand new products it's a bit strange to me if this is indeed about uh, public and human health. So again, why not therapeutics and prophylaxis? Wouldn't that be a more cost-effective way to, to deal with this? And wouldn't that be more beneficial to a, a wider range of people in the human population? Why aren't the most cost-effective preventative methods being promoted, being pushed as heavily as these uh, biological products are, such as vitamin D, such as clean eating and clean water and regular exercise. For those of you who don't know, the best, the best weapon anybody has against any virus or any illness is a, a balanced, healthy immune system. And you cannot have a balanced, healthy immune system if you are vitamin D deficient. So something that, that every government should be promoting right now is that every single person gets their vitamin D levels checked right now and to maintain a schedule of checking. And if you are vitamin D deficient, then you need to either get more sunshine if you can, or you need to supplement with vitamin D. I think it was 100% of people who were tested for vitamin D deficiencies who ended up in the ICU from COVID were, were found to be vitamin D deficient. I don't have that uh, reference here, but you can look that up easily, and I'm sure you're going to find that it's true. So just some final thoughts. There's currently absolutely no way to predict potential detrimental outcomes with regards to severe adverse events or adverse events in general, both in the long term and in the short term. I mean, we can look at the, the adverse event data as we have, and it looks kind of obvious that this is exponential growth. So we, get, we have an idea of what's going to happen, but we can't predict it. And what concerns me the most are the immunological complications that are potentially on our doorstep. I, I actually wouldn't call them complications. I would call it a disaster that's on our doorstep. 
And on that note, I'd like to end uh, with a little levity because everybody needs a laugh in these terrible times. This is a little uh, meme, I guess it's called, that I found on the internet. And uh, it appears to be a, a job interviewer asking what the, uh, the interviewee learned during their lockdown time. <laughs> and you can see what they learned and what I learned as well. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank James Lyons Weiler for connecting me with you people and also for his support and help in promoting my work. Um, and I welcome questions now. I'm going to uh, end the presentation that's recorded and it will be the, the live version of myself. So uh, I'm willing and ready for questions if you have them. And again, thank you very much for listening.